nostro show, non vuoi prendere la frase? Good morning, good, good morning everyone one more time. Welcome to International Conference Open Readings 2018. Uh, organizers, glad to see you all here in this old audience, full audience of young scientists. And also we have some vulnerable guests uh, today with us. Uh, they are the mayor of Vilnius city, Remigius Shimashis, and his co-advisor, Albertas Lakštauskas. Also, the director of State Research Institute Center for Physical Sciences and Technologies, Gintaras Valushis. <laughs> and the dean of Vilnius University, Faculty of Physics, Jozas Schulzkus. <laughs> and now let me invite the mayor for opening ceremony, to start the opening ceremony. Thank you so much. You know, what you typically expect from a politician, from a mayor, for example, coming to a conference, of course, saying some boring words uh, about how our city, not, how nice is our city and how important is the conference. And of course, all it's, it's true. It, 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 it is so. Uh, but you know, uh, I would like to start, uh, to start my, my few, few words with, uh, with uh, the things which are very far from science and which are not yet discovered by science, at least to, to the very reliable level. Uh, you know, I would like to welcome you to Vilnius, uh, those of you who are not citizens of Vilnius, uh, which is the most happy city in European Union. <laughs> officially, officially. <laughs> yeah, you may applause, of course. <laughs> okay. uh, I know it's, it's not a hard uh, science and hard, hard data, but when the European Commission ordered uh, a survey in all European capitals and other cities, uh, questioning simple questions, and for example, are you happy living in this particular city, in your city? So on positive side, we have 98%, uh, 98 yes, and we beat Stockholm and Copenhagen by, by 1%, and it's officially the happiest city. I know it sounds like Russian election results, but, 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 <laughs> but, but it, 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 it's, it's true. So, first of all, uh, why this is so important for me as a mayor, you know, when I speak to investors, to scientists, to everyone, and inviting to Vilnius, and the question is how to invite, how to, to what's, what is the most important thing to have a new investment and new things uh, to be in the city, in Vilnius in this, in this, in this case. And today it's not, it's not money, today it's uh, talent. And talent uh, means talented people. And talented people today have a privilege to live wherever they want in the globe. Uh, and uh, when they decide where to live, there are certain aspects. And at the end of the day, it's the feeling, are you happy in the city or not happy in the city? Of course, it depends on particular issues like bicycle route, which I'm very glad that it's, it's open last year here, or public transport or public spaces, or the level of education if you have children already, or similar issues. So, it's the most important issue to attract talents, to attract investment, and to have a blossoming atmosphere for the city. Uh, so this is the most important thing. Another thing, the second and the last one I would like to say about, about Vilnius is that, of course, in order to compete on the uh, international level in science or in, in economy, uh, of course, you have uh, to be competitive and to have, like, money, for, first of all. And we have to acknowledge that Vilnius is not the richest city yet. It's, it will be, I, I, I know, but, but not, 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 not yet. But, but money is not everything. Sometimes you have very rich cities which are a little bit boring, a little bit uh, like, fro like frozen, and uh, you don't have these dynamics. And what, what is dynamics? Um, and in social area, dynamics is, first of all, to be more open than others and faster than others to invite new things, including, uh, including creative disruption of, of, of the old, old uh, existing systems. And Vilnius is this, in this respect has a very clear and sound policy of being faster than others and more open than others. And it comes to all areas, whatever you, you name. Uh, just, just I typically give them like 
example everyone knows, uh, for example, Uber company. You know, it's, it's not startup anymore, it's a huge corporation, it operates in more than 500 cities in, in the world. But, you know, I'm reading in newspapers or in, in portals time to time that London, some other cities are forbidding the company because they don't have, somehow don't fit into their structures. And it sounds very strange to me all the time because, because we have very clear strategy to be open to all new initiatives and to be fast and the most fast city to accept those. So Uber company, when they come to Vilnius, it took for them from the first step on Lithuanian, on Vilnius soil, to the practical operations, uh, less than four weeks to start operations. And this is the fastest result so far in the globe. And, this, and we are twice as fast as the sec in comparison to second fastest city. So, so we, are, we are really fast in all, 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 all issues. Of course, it happens, things happen, but it's our goal to be the most fast and the most open city, wherever. Speaking about openness, again, we have the most, rad, op, most radical open data policy uh, in all European cities. Who wants to like, challenge me, please, please do. <laughs> but we have a very clear, deliberate policy of like, uh, radical open data, and we, have, uh, very, we practice that. At the end of the day, we have very good results, which combines uh, scientific inventions to, to, to business initiatives, like traffic company. I know those who are film citizens, I, I guess that you know how to, how, to, how to use it. But those of you who are guests of Vilnius, you may, you ask, you may ask Vilnius citizens and they will show. Uh, actually, this lead, leading company in the world in providing mobility as a service, uh, service which combines everything. It, it looks very simple at the end of the day when you use it, but it was very complicated to, 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 to create that. And the question why it was created in Vilnius, uh, the answer is because it's a complete open data city. And it's very, very important for us. So again, being a mayor of the most happy and the most open and fast city, <laughs> I would like to welcome you in this conference and of course to wish all the great, bright ideas to which will bring us to the more brilliant and the most rich future in our city and in your cities if you are guests uh, from other cities as well. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite Director Gintaras Volushis. Dear Hornwell guests, uh, dear friends and colleagues. On the behalf of the Center of Physical Science and Technology, I would like to welcome you here in this beautiful, lovely place called Sandra's Valley. And uh, Open Readings is a beautiful event uh, that we uh, planned, we expect, and we are waiting for. So uh, usually I repeat for my students one famous phrase given by Aldous Huxley, which he, he once he said, even if I could be a Shakespeare, I think that I still, still choose to be a Faraday. So I wish you Faraday spirit here. I wish you enlightening discussions. I wish you to celebrate physics and natural scientists, not only here in open readings, but also in your beautiful scientific journey. Thank you. And now let's invite Vedin Gazas Shulskus. Good morning. So almost everything is said. So I will be brief. Uh, uh, once more, uh, welcome dear guests, uh, dear participants. Welcome to Open Readings Conference. I wish you fruitful discussions. And uh, of course, maybe you will have some free time if you wish, uh, you can ask your organizers and uh, uh, you can see any physics faculty laboratories. We are always at your service. Uh, next, uh, I invite you to see Vilnius. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the weather is too cold. We apologize. Uh, but uh, uh, but I, I hope that it will be compensated by a warm uh, atmosphere and discussions at the conference. So, uh, good luck and welcome once more. Thank you all of you for nice words and now I would like to go briefly through the program, technical 
stuff some. So each day we have we have two, two invited speakers. In between, there are students' oral and poster sessions. The day ends with student oral sessions as well. Please enjoy cafe breaks during the, the conference, which will be on your left out, outside this audience. And we encourage you to participate in social evenings, which would, will be today, one will be today and another one on Thursday. And of course, uh, conference uh, party ceremony on Friday. So the upcoming events you can see here, it will be today discussion future technologies and on Thursday, another one discussion life in cosmos. And now dear participants, some main facts about this year's Open Readings Conference. So this year we have submitted our 350 abstracts and program committee accepted on the 306. So you went through a real selection and all participants represent 13 European countries, not only Lithuania, but as you see, it's students from Norway, Sweden, Germany, Poland, Austria, Latvia, Serbia, Belarus, Czech Republic, Ukraine, Romania, and even Russia. So this year you could choose from wide range of topics from astrophysics, theoretical physics, lasers, modern sciences like optoelectronic devices, condensed matter physics, biochemistry, genetics, and so on. So really wide range of possibilities to choose. And what else? Important statistics, as we see this year, we have equal distribution between PhD, bachelor, and master students. So just listen to the numbers. We have 96 bachelor students, 97 master students, 93 PhD students, and even six postdocs. So it's really impressive. And through the, these four days, you will hear 56 oral presentations and 250 poster presentations. And the main result this year, thanks to the biomedicine and chemistry, we have equal 50 to 50 splitting ratio between female and male students. <laughs> you can applause, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this year we invited eight lecturers which represent six countries like USA, United Kingdom, Denmark, Belgium, Austria and Lithuania. So you will hear topics like quantum technologies with defects, like microfossils in meteorites, like GPS system in your brain and so on. Those topics are really worth your time. And the last, your scientific trip through open readings begins today and will before all this, you will have a great conference. We wish you to enjoy your time, which you will spend in Vilnius. Have a great conference. Okay. Okay. Th thank you. And no worries, we are not late because we have extra 15 minutes. One uh, of speakers from oral session one is not coming. So now the word goes to Dr. Lina Svilchauskas. Thank you very much. So, uh, welcome to the Open Readings 2018. This is my first Open Readings as well, so this is something new. Our first plenary speaker today is Dr. Odris Olkowskis. And um, I think it was a couple of years ago we met with Odris in California, and he was asking me, what, like, I'm interested in defects. Do you know who, anybody else who is interested in defects? I said, well, pretty much everybody except crystallographers. So, <laughs> so today we're going to hear his talk where he's going to talk about defect as a device. Aldris, the stage is yours. Hey, thanks, Linus. I just will test, will test, will test, will test. It works and it works. Uh, please, please come. Don't, don't stand in the way. Be brave. So thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to be in this conference and to open this conference. And it's my second time only because I could not participate in previous times. It always clashed with some other conferences. And thanks for really inviting. And uh, open readings has become uh, something uh, very cool over the years. And it's, uh, it's really exciting to be part of it. So. Uh, 
since this is the first uh, uh, lecture of the conference and the audience is mainly composed of students, I will try to give slightly a broader perspective than I usually do in scientific presentations, and only part of the presentation will be really about my work and the work of our group. So the title of the talk is Defect is a Device, and I will first give you a background, what it is, and lead you uh, through the developments. So first, uh, acknowledgements. I want to acknowledge all the people uh, I've been working with. So first of all, the members of our group, which is called uh, Puntukas Group, uh, unofficially, uh, Lukas, Majena, Vitutas, and also our collaborators, Marcus, Chris, and Adam, and also many other people with whom we discuss and talk. And uh, we are happy to have them all. And actually, Majena and Vitutas will give their talks later in the week. And unfortunately, Lima, Lima, uh, could not come, even though she had to give a talk. So, first of all, let me give you a slightly broader introduction, which is called Quo Vadis Physica, Where Are You Going Physics? Uh, first of all, let me start by saying that Open Readings is 61 years old today, so it's good, right? But compared to other conferences, one can say it's simply old. I mean, because not all conferences survive uh, that long. So how do you know it's old? Because it has a very beautiful but a very completely logical name. Um, Mayor of Vilnius said that Vilnius is open, and that's why you can say Open Readings also comes from that, but no, Open Readings uh, originated in Soviet times, and uh, it makes sense in Lithuanian. Lithuania is great in way where kind of people gather freely to discuss ideas, and it's all free and, and free spirit and so on. But when you translate it into English, it does not really make sense. But actually, we are in a good company because a lot of old things don't really make sense. For example, English writing. It's pretty old, but if you say the four letters E-I-G-H, it can be anything you like. Eight, height, Lee, no rules at all. Or the letters O-U-G-H can be read as through, though, tough, ought. So basically, uh, no logic, because it's old. Uh, similar French writing. I mean, in French, if you want to say, what is this, you cannot say this. You have to say, what is this that it is? You cannot simply say, what is this? You have to say, what is this that it is? I mean, and you would not guess how it's pronounced. You, you write like this, and you pronounce simply, qu'est-ce que c'est? I mean, if you don't know French, you would not guess it. Uh, at variance, Lithuanian writing is new. It's a bit more than 100 years old, and it's very logical, right? You would write eight, height, li. I mean, everything is logical. So, and qu'est-ce que c'est? You would simply write like that. Why would you write like that? So we come to the conclusion that actually English writing is old, French writing is old, and Lithuanian writing is new, because neither French nor English writing make any sense. What about physics? So some things in physics make sense. So electricity and magnetism, electron, electricity comes from the word amber, electron, and magnet, magnetis, comes a stone from magnesia. It makes sense because uh, a, a stone from magnesia it can be magnetic, and you can produce electricity by just rubbing a piece of amber. But some things in physics don't really make sense. For example, if you look at the secular equation, and let's check what the word secular means in English dictionary, not connected with religious or spiritual matters. I mean, what about Newton's second law? What about all the other equations? So all f equations in physics are secular, except probably for the Maxwell's demon and the Higgs boson. But we actually, in reality, the word secular here has different meaning. It comes from the word, word uh, uh, century, siècle in French. And in principle, it has meaning, but this meaning, if you don't know it, has been lost. So we, we know that physics is old. And you don't have to trust my word if you just go to Google and type old. And if you look at the pictures, so you will see a person, Albert Einstein, who comes third. So we know that physics is old. But actually, it's, take my word for it. If you type young, what you get, you get young Sheldon. And actually, in a couple of places. And young Sheldon is also a physicist, so you also know that physics is new. So physics is, is both old and new. It has past and it has uh, the future. So let's become more serious. And this is one of my personal opinion. What's the future of physics? 
And let's take an example, so uh, you, you don't have to believe me, but this is the way I see things moving, in particular in solid state physics, uh, where, where I'm working. So let's take, and as an example, part of chemistry which, called, uh, which is called organic synthesis. I'm not a chemist, so excuse me for the simplistic point of view, but this is how I see things. So this is time, 1800s, 1900s, 2000s. So, uh, and we, we study the development of organic synthesis, so the concept of a chemical structure in the middle of the 19th century, then discovery of petroleum really uh, provided a boost for the entire science, and then quantum mechanics in the beginning of the 20th century, the, in the first half of the 20th century, chemical bond explained. And the landmark was 1965 Nobel Prize for Robert Woodward, who got a Nobel Prize for something called total synthesis. So total synthesis, if, though for those who are not chemists, is uh, synthesizing a molecule, an organic molecule, from small uh, molecules that are readily available, that are very cheap. So basically, instead of drawing something on the piece of paper, you ba basically produce it. So this is not as simple as it seems. For example, the landmark of organic synthesis this was the synthesis of B12 uh, vitamin. And for example, the total synthesis of kinin, a uh, rather simple molecule, which it seems was achieved only in 2001. And this still continues. So the way I see things, so that was the era of understanding. The rules were kind of set. And then after the era of understanding came, comes the era of creation. And essentially it becomes art. So the rules are set and it becomes art, how you develop and make uh, things that did not exist before. So uh, maybe it's too simplistic and you have certain toolbox uh, to do things. So if we come now to solid state physics, not uh, different areas of physics are different. So before 1900s, there was no solid state physics uh, to speak of, but uh, for, uh, this is from now 1900, 1950, 2000. So X-ray diffraction of crystals, the 1910. Quantum mechanics, the band structure, very important concept. Transistor was proposed based on the understanding of the band structure. Superconductivity explained. And then if we go further, so we go to the end of the 20th century, we, we see the invention of the STM, seeing atoms one by one. We see the in, uh, discovery of high TC superconductors, quantum Hall effect, very exotic excitations. Nanotechnology, uh, which producing very small things, atom by atom, topological properties. Inver and then in the early, in the 21st century came this concept of inverse material design. Instead of having a material and then finding its properties, defining properties and then trying to find the material that suits these properties. Uh, you know, the materials, genome pro pro uh, project, quantum information, and so on. So drawing a per per uh, analogy with organic synthesis, this is the era of understanding, which still in some areas continues. And then comes the era of creation, where we create new things uh, that did not exist before. And, uh, and this is uh, how I see the development of solid state physics. In my opinion, it has really uh, still a, a very good future for the next 50 or 100 years. Of course, it will change to something else. We, do, we never know what it will change to, but uh, uh, we have a very interesting toolbox uh, to create new things. Quantum mechanics, aerodynamics, mechanics, thermodynamics, material science, optics, and so on. And, uh, using all these different pieces of physics. And importantly, if you want to succeed in science, you have to know all these disciplines. You create things that kind of seem exotic, but that did not exist before. So in this vein, I also see my research in this era of, in this understanding and then creation. So specifically, yeah, specifically, the title of my talk is Defect as a Device, and this is just, I was paraphrasing the phrase of Herbert Kramer, Nobel, who got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2000, who said, interface is the device. So, uh, Her Herbert Kramer invented a few, a few uh, new semiconductor devices, for example, heterojunction bipolar transistor, he was the father of heterojunctions, and what he noticed, he noticed that uh, a lot of important things that happen in these devices happen because of interfaces and happen at the interfaces. So basically, if we have an interface between two materials, so this is a sketch and this is, can be a real uh, electron microscope picture, so a lot of things happen here. 
So in a similar vein, one can ask, so can a point defect also be a device? So instead of interface between two materials, you have some, so interface is kind of irregularity in the material, and this is also an irregularity which is now zero-dimensional except of two-dimensional, and we ask, can this also be a device in the same way that Herbert Kramer said that interface is the device? So, and uh, I will discuss only one aspect of, uh, of this research. It's point defects, a single photon emitters, and that's subtitled Physics of Ultimate Solid State Light Bulbs. So let me tell what it is. Sorry, I will just drink water. You can always interrupt and ask questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I always get the same remark, but I never learn. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I'll try. So. Uh, if we see the evolution of light sources uh, throughout the history of, let's say, humanity. So, first of all, we have the sun. Uh, uh, the diameter of the sun is about uh, one million kilometers, a, a bit more than one million kilometers, and the sun produces 10 to the 45 photons per second. Uh, this is a number that we cannot really digest. This is a, a big number. Uh, then if you come to a common light bulb that we have in our houses or anywhere, the diameter is about 10 uh, centimeters and it produces 10 to the 19th photons per second. Of course, if you do this extrapolation, you can imagine that the smallest possible light bulb is just something that emits a single photon at a time. So if you have one atom, it can, it can emit only one photon at a time, usually. And there are many other single photon emitters, so uh, the diameter is, let's say, from uh, 1 to 100 nanometers. And if we constantly excite it, uh, it can emit about 10 to the 7, uh, 100, uh, 10 million photons at a time. So this, is, this device is called a single photon emitter. So now, a bit more specifically, a single photon emitter is a device that has some kind, some kind of a push, push button, and if we push this button, we produce one photon on demand. So we push the button, there is one photon on demand. Push the button, one photon at a time. So it should be deterministic, and it should produce a photon in a given quantum state, a very specific frequency and polarization. So why do we need uh, single photon emitters? So one example is something, uh, one, one area of quantum communication is called quantum key distribution. So uh, now let's say we have, so in, uh, we have two partners, usually they are called Alice and Bob in, in communication uh, theory, but uh, we will call it Albert and Sheldon. These are two physicists, two prominent <laughs> uh, physicists, and they want to share information, and they want to share information in such a way that a third person, it can be a very young uh, person, very talented from a new generation, should not uh, uh, really take this information. So this person can be a Russian spy, uh, or it can be a chemist. Uh, so you want to share, to share information, and usually in classical communication, these two people share a key, a key to encode and decode information, and the complexity of the and the first the third person who is called eavesdropper eve cannot really uh, detect this key and classically uh, classically the key is made the the, the uh, security of the key relies on the complexity to calculate certain mathematical functions it's not impossible to decode the key but in principle it's rather difficult in quantum uh, communication these two partners share a quantum key and a quantum key, let's say uh, Albert generates a quantum key and wants to s s send it to Sheldon and because if one measures a quantum state and if it let's say, produces a set of entangled photons and if uh, a third person measures this key, Albert knows that somebody interceded uh, in the communication channel so basically, quantum communication is just sending the key 
by a quantum channel, com being completely sure, but nobody intercepts it. And then once the key is there, the communication is completely classical, uh, like a normal communication. And so there are many protocols of, and this is called quantum key distribution. So the key is distributed over the quantum channel. And there are many protocols. And the most, uh, one of the first ones was is so-called BB84 protocol. And it requires that we are able to send and generate single photons. So Albert has to have a way to generate single photons. Another use of single photons is so-called optical linear quantum computer where uh, uh, the photon itself is so-called flying qubit. And if we have zero photons, uh, it's called zero. And if we have one photon, it's one. And also, there are many protocols of this optical near quantum computing. The most famous is the KLM protocol. So as you understand, both quantum communication and, let's say, optical quantum computing is a science by itself. This is requires, so these are separate topics, but in all of those, we require single photon sources that we are able to have a push button and to generate photons on demand. So for these applications, we need single photon emitters. So, of course, single photon emitter, as we said, the ultimate single photon emitter is one atom, but an atom cannot just fly in free space. We have to fix it. And we fix it usually in a lattice. And once we fix it in a lattice, it's nothing else but a point defect. And uh, you can think of it as jailed atoms, jailed atoms that do a certain kind of uh, job, but they are jailed in a, in a good way. They are, they, they are pretty happy. So now the science of point defects is old. I mean, I can also say, right, it's old. But what's specific about uh, this area? So let me try to, I try to think myself, but let me explain to you. So usually we have a one point defect in the lattice. So what we want to do, we have a laser with a push button and uh, we shine laser on a large area. So you cannot focus on the laser in, to, to the spot smaller than the wavelength. So we basically cover a really large area many thousands and millions of atoms. So what you do, you excite a system to an excited state, and it generate a photon. Uh, and then generate a photon. Generate a photon just pushing this push button. What's specific, what's important is this. Uh, we want that the laser excites only one defect. That means it should be well separated from all the other defects of the same kind. So, for example, if we require that those defects are separated by 10 micrometers, we come to the defect density concentrations 10 to the ninth. I mean, this seems, might seem very large to you, but it's completely, completely, completely negligible to compare to all the other defects that we study in materials. This is absolutely tiny. And this makes it so special. Since this is absolutely tiny concentrations, we are dealing with very different beasts than our typical defects. Usually, these single photon emitters are very, very rare defects uh, with very, very high formation energies. Usually, they are very exotic combinations, and they are very different from different uh, typical defects that exist in many materials. That's why there have been so far in the last 20 years, only 20 point defects that have been proven to emit single photons. Because materials have to be so clean and the defect concentrations have to be so small. And that's why, in my opinion, it shows slightly towards a different material science, uh, material science of very clean materials. That's why we are building on the science of point defects that has been existing for 80, 90 years and so on. But we are entering a new era where we can really probe much cleaner materials and much more exotic species. So one uh, prominent example is a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, the most prominent example. So this is a complex between a nitrogen and a vacancy in a diamond lattice. It's called the NV center. Uh, NV center is a defect that has spin. It's a small magnet. And if we shine light, we can polarize the spin. This is very peculiar, and it was the first uh, single defect ever detected, and it happened uh, last year, it was 20 year anniversary, so 20 years ago, 
It was the first ever single defect detected in a material by optical means. And a few years afterwards, it was really a, a proof that these are really single defects. They showed a very clear anti-bunching signature. They were, uh, didn't bleach, they were stable. So anti-bunching, that means that photons are emitted one by one in a train. And they are also called quantum emitters. This is just semantics. Quantum emitters, it means emitter that emits one photon. And this is non-classical light. This light is very different from the coherent light produced by a laser or incoherent light produced by the sun or a light bulb. So it's a very different kind of light. So, and what, in, in, in our group, what we want to know then? We want to know if we have a, a material, a valence band, a conduction band, we have a band gap, we want to know where is the, uh, the states, the ground state, the excited state of the defect is. We want to understand the excitation process, so exciting, uh, so excitation, absorption, and luminescence. Luminescence happen, can happen in two ways, so a system can undergo a transition like in an atom between two states, or during the emission of the photon, it can also excite lattice vibrations. The atoms can start to vibrate, and therefore the energy of the photon is smaller, and there is a probability of this emission without any exciting vibrations, and there's a certain probability of a transition where uh, vibrations are excited, and this produces the luminescence line shape. So the lumines this is energy, this is luminescence intensity. So if the transition produces no vibrations, we have a very sharp peak, and this is the peak that we want. It's called the zero phonon line. And there is a certain probability that during optical emission, vibrations are excited, and that's, we have this so-called phonon sideband. So important factor is that the bi waller factor, so the probability of, a of an atomic transition whereby no phonons are excited. This is exactly the transition we are interested in because in, there's a chance that in this transition, uh, photons have well-defined energy, well-defined polarization, and they are coherent. So, in addition, what can happen, the defect can have uh, dark states. Dark states allow for non-radiative transition from the excited state to the ground state. It produces heat, it doesn't produce any photons, this is bad. And we want to, and the ratio of the radiative versus the non-radiative transition is called the branching ratio, which we also want to understand. So, if the, so what we want to know, if the atomic structure of the defect we know, we want to learn the excited level structure, phonon sideband, vibrations, radiative and non-radiative transitions, excitation mechanisms. If the structure is unknown, we want to understand formation, energy, stability, and so on. And once we understand this, our final goal is design ideal systems that will be ideal single photon emitters, so ideal uh, uh, single photon light bulbs. So in the vein of what I was telling in the beginning, this is the understand phase, and this is the creation phase. And uh, since there are still not too many systems that are known to emit single photons, we're still very early in the understanding phase, even though there is a big pressure and big need to create systems that would be much more ideal. So the way we do it, we do it by uh, theory and first principles calculations. We are theorists, and just quickly over, so if we have an atomic structure, and we want to understand all these uh, electronic processes. So basically we solve Schrodinger's equation with a certain approximation for the electrons. And once the density of electrons is known, the ions move according to the forces set by the density of this, these electrons. The system founds, finds its minimum and the approximate solution uh, to the Schrodinger equation is provided by density functional theory. These are just maybe for the experts. And this is a huge field by itself, which has been developing over many years. And in 2000, we use advanced functionals that provide increasingly better accuracy of description of materials. So we have been using so-called hybrid density functionals that started in solid state physics more or less in 2005. Then more recently, the RPA functionals that are still very new. And we are trying to, 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 to follow the developments. Uh, we want to defect to have a solid state environment, so uh, we use so-called supercell approach. Uh, and the electronic part, we don't program ourselves. There's a huge, huge, huge number of people who are developing 
and devoting their lives only to this part of the problem. So we use existing codes. What we do ourselves, uh, we treat excited states. So currently we use certain approximate methods, but we want to go to something else in the future. And most importantly, we're developing te techniques for vibrations, vibronic coupling, non relative transitions, and so on. So this is, this is our vein of research. So now certain, ex certain, uh, certain uh, results. So we take the same NV center, and this is just to show you how good or how bad, depending on, 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 on your approach, the theory is. So this is a luminescent spectrum of the same NV center energy and this is normalized luminescence so that all the, the, the entire curve integrates to one. So I choose it like that. So we have a zero phonon line, and, and, and the black is experiment, blue is theory, and what's, so we compare experiment and theory, so this is uh, the zero phonon line, and experiment tells us that only 3% of the entire uh, light comes into this peak, so only 3% of the entire area falls into this peak. The theory agrees pretty much. And, oh, tu -tu -tu, tu -tu -tu. and uh, what we also can reproduce is these so-called uh, phonon side peaks. And we get the energy separation from the zero phonon line 65 MeV compared to experiment 64 MeV. This has been done in 2014. And the agreement is pretty good, but Lucas, uh, uh, my student, he actually even improved, he converts the system much better, and he even managed to get the subtle, the subtle structure in the spectra. So it's not to my opinion, this is the best agreement for a defect spectrum between theory and experiment that, that ever existed. But we used many approximations and the work continues, so uh, Lucas is working on absorption, vibronic coupling and so on. We want to really to build a machinery to, to, to understand all these, all these things. So, so immediately we see a problem. And we sent, even though it was the first defect to have been ever detected as a single site, it's not ideal. So we see luminescence, and only a very small fraction of luminescence falls into this zero phonon, uh, zero, uh, phonon line. It has a small debye wall factor. So this is very typical for dipole allowed transitions. If we have a dipole, uh, dipole forbidden transition, typically we have very large Debye Waller factor. So a lot of luminescence falls into the zero phonon line, and the phonon side band is very small. But unfortunately, for a single photon emitter, we want photons to be produced at a very high pace. So basically, we enter into problem. We need, oh, sorry, we need large Debye Waller factors like here but a strong dipole transition like here. So what do we do? We have to combine two properties that kind of go against each other. So one strategy is consider defects with inversion symmetry. So this is goes, goes into this vein of engineering. So if we have inversion symmetry, so phonons can be either even or uneven with respect to inversion. So in science it's called gerade or ungerade. And if the defect has uh, inversion symmetry both in excited state and the ground state. So vibrations, even vibrations cannot participate in this optical transition. They are completely taken out of the picture and we can expect a much larger Debye Wall factor. So basically, instead of considering systems that don't have inversion symmetry, consider systems that do have inversion symmetry and see where it, that leads to us. And one, uh, one example is silicon vacancy center in diamond which basically is identical uh, to the nitrogen vacancy, so it's a silicon next to a vacant, vacancy site. But since silicon is very large, it moves to the site in the middle between two the vacancies, and in that way, the system already has inversion symmetry, and from the C3V point group, you have a D3D point group. And sure enough, uh, the by wall effect of the system is 70% compared to 3% to the NV center. This is good, this is very good. Uh, but so now we have again the luminescence spectrum. Now it's written in wavelengths rather than energy, but the zero phonon line is here. It has 70% of the entire uh, luminescence. So let's look only at the blue curve. Uh, so this is good, but what is strange and what we don't understand is the entire structure of the phonon sideband. So experimentally, you see a very broad feature at 40 MeV and a much narrower feature at 64 MeV. So what we understand, what we want to understand, what are these modes? 
And these modes have been shown to have very strange and unusual isotope shifts. So if you substitute silicon 28 with silicon 29 and silicon, 20 and silicon 30, the system behaves as if a silicon atom is attached to a hard wall. So the isotope shift reflects only the change of the mass of the silicon atom. What you would expect uh, if you know vibrational spectroscopy, so each vibration has its own reduced or effective mass, and you would expect there would be some mixture of the silicon mass and the carbon mass, and you would expect the isotope shift to be smaller than this number. But instead what you get, that the whole isotope shift is in the silicon uh, mass, so to speak. We want to understand why, and we also want to understand can we calculate the spectrum. So we answered the first question, but not the second one. So I will run very quickly. These are uh, slide details. But simply, what we do, we build a methodology to really calculate very, very, very large systems. So what you see here is just uh, computational uh, uh, oscillations. Don't uh, pay uh, to pay attention. But what can be seen very clearly that, that is there is a quasi-local vibration. This is a guide to announce extremely, extremely narrow at 43 MeV, and silicon vibrates like a ball up and down. So the symmetry of the vibration, we do the same uh, for a different symmetry. Sorry, this is an error, AU, EU, but it, it doesn't really matter. Then we see a different vibration where silicon uh, vibrates in a different direction. And finally, we can also explain the isotopic shifts. So in the end, it's rather simple. So if you have a density of states of vibrations in the silicon lattice, so uh, vibrations in sil uh, silicon diamond uh, they uh, start at uh, zero and end at 167. So basically, what happens if you have the iso uh, local vibration which falls outside the phonon spectrum of diamond, uh, you have the local mode, and the local mode, uh, uh, sorry, this is wrong picture. Uh, so, the, sorry, <laughs> a local mode is characterized by reduced mass, by effective mass, and the isotopic shift indeed is much smaller. Uh, it reflects an average of the two masses, so it would be much smaller than the full isotopic shift uh, of the silicon atom. But if you have a quasi-local mode, uh, which falls in the bulk uh, diamond phonon spectrum, it can happen that the, the mode, the frequency of the mode, reflects only the mass of the silicon atom. And this comes out of calculations, but we also ask uh, Algirdas Matulis, who we are happy to have in our building, who solves essentially all our problems. And he built a simple 1D model that showed very clearly this property. And, and we sent certain approximation. If we have a resonance, so a quasi-local mode, so if there was a local mode, so a local mode that couples to a bulk phonon modes, it attains an imaginary frequency, so basically it gets broader, but its frequency does not shift. And we have a local mode outside the phonon spectrum, it acquires a real frequency shift. So basically that explains these, these findings. And the luminescence spectrum, we could also explain in a certain way that this feature is actually many symmetric modes, even though we said symmetric modes don't participate, but they do in a way. And this is uh, EU mode and A2U modes are silent, and we don't know yet why. So now, coming to an end of, of, of the talk, so, so far we considered diamond. And diamond is a very hard material to process. Uh, you can grow various, only very small crystals. You want to go into some other materials. And many people considered other materials for single photon emitters. So now if we uh, go into binary system, let's say IAB semiconductors, so, uh, oh sorry, group five, it's an error, group four, three, five of two sixes. So we are, end up, for example, either in the zinc blend lattice, so cubic silicon carbide, gallium marcinite, gallium phosphide, or wurzite crystals, so wurzite silicon carbide, gallium nitride, aluminum nitride, zinc oxide. So people work ex uh, uh, a lot on these systems, but there's a problem. These systems ha have no inversion symmetry, and if a crystal doesn't have inversion symmetry, it has its piezoelectric. It has a zinc blend, zinc blend uh, systems are uh, weaker piezoelectric crystals than wurzite, but they are piezoelectric nonetheless. And if you think a little bit, this is extremely bad for single photon emission. Why it's bad, I will not explain, but 
it basically kills the zero phone online. People haven't realized that completely, but uh, this is true. So we said inversion symmetry is important. So that's slightly of a problem because it reduces the frequency of our choice to study binary and more complicated systems. But actually, if you come to layered materials, let's say transition metal dichalcogenides, TMDs, molybdenum disulfide, tungsten, the telluride, or hexagonal boron nitride, very good. These system, systems have inversion symmetry. And for example, in uh, boron nitride inversion uh, symmetry, inversion point, it's in between the layers, similar to here, and this is very good. And we have been working on hexagonal boron nitride for the last three years. So uh, you will see more talks by Magena and Vitutas in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this week. I will not touch upon these systems, but just I want to give you an idea what systems are good and what systems are bad. So, so far, we talked about single photon emitters, and that was the focus of my, of my talk. And uh, what I did not talk about, and uh, one would need entire different lectures, many other applications. So uh, as you see in single photon emission, no spin is required. It can be there, but it's not required. So uh, one idea is, based, for example, of silicon-based nuclear spin quantum computer proposed by Kane in 1998, where actually nuclear spins attached to phosphorus donors can act, act as qubits. So it's a very intensive research area, and number one, and number two, and number three countries are Australia, Australia, and Australia, who are developing these, uh, this research pretty much, and this is one of their primary research targets. And some people that we collaborate in Australia uh, who work on diamond, uh, they are unhappy, but uh, Australia actually is a rather big player, huge player in, term, in, in, in this field, both in diamond and, and silicon. So similarly, uh, our, my, our colleague Ma uh, Marcus Doherty proposed an idea of a quantum computer in diamond, on-chip quantum computer, where you have the same NV center and other uh, defects, and electrons transmit information from one uh, center to, to another. This is, this is a very difficult idea, and there are many, many problems to, to overcome. Uh, what's closest to commercialization for point defects is point defects for nanoscale sensing. So electric and magnetic fields, temperature, pressure, if we are, have an NV center in a nano diamond, and we measure optical response of NV center, we can really measure magnetic fields. We can measure fluctuations in electric fields that gives people idea, maybe in the future, to measure fluctuations of the neurons uh, of electric field due to electrical, field, uh, electrical current flow in neurons. And there are already uh, so it does, it's not necessarily quantum technology. Sensing is not necessarily quantum technology. It is quantum technology if you use properties of coherence. So some sensors, based on defects, for example, uh, uh, rubidium, uh, ruby crystals are used routinely in labs to measure uh, pressure in diamond anvil cells. So this is a pretty established technology, but if you can use the properties of quantum coherence, you can enhance sensitivity dram dramatically. And the last uh, area is uh, point defects for spin photon interfaces, again, where you could entangle a spin on a defect with a photon that flies away. And in that way, just looking at the state of a spin, you can tell what's happening to the photon. So I. So one could talk about these uh, separately. I focused only on single photon emitters and just want to conclude if you want to learn more. So a very, very nice review uh, by uh, Misha Lukin and, and his colleagues in Physics Today, atomic light crystals from quantum computers to biological sensors. And if you want to learn more about first principles calculation, so this year uh, we published uh, annual reviews of materials research about more specifically theoretical, uh, theoretical aspects. So instead of a conclusion, let me give you the vision. So there are many, many, many different materials. And some people think that there are many more materials that are undiscovered than the materials that are discovered. But 
I mean, you can imagine there are yet many, 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 many more point defects because each material produces a variety of imperfections. Imperfections are more common than uncommon. So there is a huge combinatorial space to explore in principle. If, if you could control uh, the devices atom by atom, so this is extremely difficult because we are used to drawing atoms, but they are very small. I mean, we forget how small, I forget because I'm a theorist, but I forget how small they are. People who work in the lab, they know how small they are. So the vision is, can we build devices atom by atom? I mean, this has been already demonstrated in the early 90s by uh, a quantum, this famous quantum coral where you have iron atoms on copper surface, and by STM you can position atoms on a surface, but everything happen is happening on the surface, and you still have some imperfections that you cannot get rid of. There are just atoms that stick too hard. But in principle, uh, the, the bad thing about metals that you cannot do much about them. I mean, they are conductors. I mean, no matter what you do, they are conductors. If you have a material that is insulator, that is becoming much more interesting because you can control it. So the question is, can we do the same with uh, semiconductors in bulk? In principle, this is a fantasy, but why not? In principle, it's doable. It Maybe not in practice. So this is the, the vision that many people share, and this is, uh, encompasses a lot of a lot of things that are happening in physics right now. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much, Aldris. I think it's time for questions. Please, don't be shy. So maybe I'll start just to open the question session. So, when you use the nuclear spins for, as for, let's say, single photon emitters, are there any differences, advantages, disadvantages? Because then you're, you're in a radio frequency range, I guess, versus where you use electronic transitions, when you are in some optical range. Are there any differences fundamentally for the, let's say, quantum communication? Uh, so you would not use uh, nuclear spins for quantum communication. You, you could use them as qubits or memory. So, so you can think of an electronic spin as a window to the world that you can control. And you can transfer this magnetization of the electron to uh, your nucleus. And actually, the, the advantage of nucleus is that it interacts extremely weakly, with a, much weaker with the environment, uh, than uh, electronic spin because it's much, 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 much smaller. And the coherences uh, uh, of nuclear spin uh, in pure materials can reach hours, days. So if you could use nuclear spins as qubits, that would be a huge advantage. The question is how to make talk to one another. And you make talk to one another having an electron spin nearby and making electron spins talk to one another, or producing photons that transmit information. So clusters of nuclear spins controlled by a single electron spin are well established. So you can have many uh, quantum computers based off seven or eight, I think, already nuclear spins controlled by a single electron spin. And since, importantly, since these nuclei are randomly distributed, each of them has slightly different frequency that you can address it. And you can make a small uh, re quantum register, but the problem, eight qubits is not enough for a quantum computer. We have one register here, you want to have another register here. And the problem is how to make nuclear spins talk to one another. Mm. So, is quantum emitter the main application for quantum computing? What else, when the, our applications could be of quantum emitters? So, I, I already told. So, having a source of single photons is important for, for, for 
yeah, so I, I don't know. So quantum communication sending uh, uh, keys, uh, optical quantum, okay, optical quantum computing is, is a tough sell. The problem that photons don't interact. And uh, so I just want to show, that was a big, okay, this is beautiful, right? To have a photon as a qubit is very beautiful. And always in, in these quantum computers, the problem is how to make two qubits talk. So I just want to show. So, I mean, photon has a defined quantum state and it's so on, but how you make two photons talk? When you send one photon to another, they don't see each other because photons interact very weakly. And that's why these people came with an idea that by measuring photon states and doing a, a lot of measurement, you can actually make two photons talk. But the problem with this scheme, I did not dwell into, into details, that the, uh, the overhead of having all these measurement devices scales kind of exponentially with the number of qubits. So each qubit has to have a lot of measuring devices and simply it explodes. So uh, I think people are still working on this and uh, there are many ideas how to make two photons, two photons talk. Uh, using nonlinear media, uh, I'm not a big expert, but this is the ba the biggest challenge in all these ideas. How you want, you can produce one qubit, no problem, but how you make two qubits talk? So I think the the, the biggest uh, the biggest uh, application is in quantum communication. The problem that uh, layered materials uh, that people study, they have high atomic numbers, so tungsten, selenide, molybdenum, disulfide, and they usually have pretty low band gaps. So pretty low band gaps, that means uh, that your, your defects are not very deep and you have to go to very low temperatures to, uh, to operate them. The, also the problem that uh, I don't think in molybdenum disulfide you see very clear defect emission. All you see is you see excitons, you see excitons attached to defects. I don't know really well established case where that would be an internal transition between the two defect states. This is very interesting. It seems a dirty material, but mostly you see excitons, trions, and so on. So it's interesting to follow. I would be very interesting to know, but it seems there are not too many cases that, fit, that would fit us. Uh, examples. Oh, bolyagraphene has a band gap of 0.07. I mean, it's, it's almost a metal. Wow, that's tough. Uh, I learned about this from Alex Zunger. Uh, maybe Linus knows. Actually, Linus is a big expert. Linus, you can maybe can answer. Next year. <laughs> uh, one way is just combinatorics. So if you want a certain property, you try many, many combinations, and you suddenly see where this property, uh, where this property pops up. Another idea, I think, is to, to find certain descriptors. So a descriptor is a combination of property of material that kind of fits the bill best. So if you want, let's say, to design the best thermoelectric, so you look at the possible thermoelectric, so it kind of goes into the vein of machine learning, and you try to let the computer find what is the best descriptor. It would be not the lattice constant. It will be not uh, the, the band gap. It will be not uh, the weight. It will be a weird combination of everything. It says take 75% of, of a conductivity plus 10.5% of something else, and you will find a weird descriptor. And then having this descriptor, you will try to then design your best material. So this is one strategy. And sometimes, 
the descriptors are so weird that you, you would not find them in 1,000 years if you would try it by yourself. So this is one way. Another way is just simple combinatorics. Uh, we will have a talk, I think, in June about this. It's an interesting area, but it's pr pretty new. I, I don't know more about it. L Linus, I think, is, is, is an expert, more of an expert. <laughs>